My guest for this show is Marshall Barnes, a research and development engineer. Marshall is an inventor, a musician, and a brilliant thinker. He has written several papers on many fascinating topics, which offer a widely different opinion on some quite controversial topics. Suffice it to say that Marshall defends his views unequivocally and is willing to engage in open debate with anyone who disputes his findings and conclusions. This is one reason why I felt compelled to interview Marshall for this podcast. Also, I find Marshall's work highly relevant to the topic of this podcast. His work and his arguments offer a viable solution that could, if funded and implemented correctly, potentially solve every possible existential threat to life on this planet. His solution? Time travel to the past. I realize this idea seems quite radical and potentially even ludicrous but I urge you to hear his argument before passing judgment. During our conversation, Marshall and I discussed his hypothesis in great detail. He argues that escaping the Earth to go into space is a huge waste of time, money, and resources. He believes his solution to be far more economical and potentially more viable. Specifically, he proposes to send groups of human settlements back in time to the year 12K B4, or 12,000 years ago roughly 10,000 BC, which is around the end of the last ice age. Unfortunately, the interview didn't go quite as planned and we experienced some technical difficulties right at the beginning. This resulted in a less than ideal audio quality and required parts of the interview to be omitted from the episode. I mention this because I don't want you to expect crystal clear audio and then two minutes in get frustrated. So please be patient, listen with an open mind, and try to enjoy the show as much as I enjoyed creating it for you. Thanks for listening. some of your papers and uh, your theory on that time travel can solve the issue of extinction level events on our planet, climate crisis, meteor strikes, nuclear war, global pandemics. It's just, it sounds to me like a perfect uh, scenario to, to get us out of these, these messes. Um, Would you briefly describe your, your uh, theory on that? This is what it boils down to. Um, I'm sure most people would remember when Stephen Hawking was still alive. And he and Elon Musk were talking about how we need to expand into space. The humanity needs to expand into space yeah. in order to survive because we're, we can't just stay on this planet and expect to uh, not ever be threatened with an extinction level event. So. Um, that's what was going on, and that's, that's what drives Elon Musk. And in terms of the space program, and of course uh, Stephen Hawking got involved with uh, an attempt to try to uh, find intelligent life out there in space. But what, what the thing is is that, and, and, and no one ever talks about this. But I do really don't know why. But hey. It doesn't matter if we expand the space or not. Not very many people are going to be able to go. I mean, it's seriously. I mean, you're talking about fewer people than are in your high school graduating class. Yeah. And that's that's doing a real. That's doing a lot. Yeah. I mean, because I mean that would be over over a long period of time. Yeah. How many and, people? Uh, even, I'm sorry. Even if they get, uh, you know, even if they do are able to make trips to Mars. <clears throat> Uh, in the in the neighborhood of two or three hundred spacecraft a year, how many people can they actually put on a on one spacecraft? Right. Well, I don't that I don't have an answer to. It. However, the problem is that we don't have 
everything fixed yet in terms of how to safely exist in outer space. Yeah. Because of the radiation and all that. That's true. Okay, plus, it's not very, I mean, it's an expensive thing to do. That's true. Not cheap. Yeah. So, the argument I had was that, and unbeknownst to most people, the effort to try to make time travel to the past possible has been progressing in leaps and bounds to the point whereby if we can do it at all, we should be able to find that out with a $100,000 budget. That is not going to be, that's like a sliver, that's like a, you know, this is a fraction yeah. of what they do, the, the money they spend on space. I mean, it's not even funny. No, so, absolutely. It's a micro yeah. fraction of what they're spending to, to just send satellites into outer space. Exactly. Yeah. So that's millions of dollars when they do it every exactly. time. Yep. So $100,000, we could find out whether, ultimately, whether we could do time travel to the past. Now, if that works, then for about another million, we could actually go ahead and start setting up a settlement back in uh, what I call Earth KB before, which is, uh, or 12 KB before, yeah. 12,000 years in the past, okay? Now, it would be a copy of the Earth as it was 12,000 years ago, uh, because we didn't get into all the dynamics of how time travel actually works, but the bottom line is that that's what you would do, and then you could set up settlements, you could uh, eventually have mining operations, all kinds of stuff going on, and it would pay for itself. And then it would pay, it would actually make money. Like, I mean, the money, amount of money you could make if you could put something like that together, and the amount of people you could save, it's pretty incredible. Right. right. I mean, it's, it's not even funny. And so it makes the whole idea, the whole notion of going to space, you know, an expensive, you know, kind of a half-cocked idea. Because <laughs> yeah. why? I mean, you go to the past, you know, the, the auctions there to breathe. You don't have to worry about all those survival kind of things. And uh, you would be the dominant, you know, uh, race there. You know, the, the, the 21st century humans would show up and set stuff up and uh, just take it from there. Um, you know, and be able to determine what kind of, uh, what, what the environment's actually like, you know, what the water's like, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we, we would need people, particularly with what's going on now, uh, try to get a handle on what kind of diseases we might have to watch out for because we wouldn't have the immune, immunity for them because we weren't around then. Yeah. You know, it could be something odd, who knows. I mean, even as the polar ice caps are melting, they're worried about certain viruses and stuff like that. Uh, coming, you know, out of being dormant and uh, being a threat. Yeah. So you have to take these things into consideration. But overall, it's about a situation where you could do this and it would be a huge payoff. Be incredible. Definitely. And not only that, if the right people find out about it, particularly in the environment where we have now, $100,000 is like a couple of, you know, guys in Hollywood or Silicon Valley, you know, playing poker, $10,000 a pop. I mean, it's like, True. it's nothing. True. Only, it, it works because we already know how to try to attempt to do this, and it has nothing to do with the theory of relativity. So anybody wants to pony up with these ideas about, well, where are you going to get the tremendous energy from, and the, all this other kind of stuff. It's like, hey, man, this is, you're in the wrong game. Well, they're all no-go solution. And that's the, that's the truth. So, and particularly, I mean, I haven't, I haven't actually been in a position to do this, but I'm certainly prepared. And as some astrophysicist comes along and says, well, you know, you, you can only do time travel to the past and you get you're some of the black hole. I was like, no, just stop, because the closest black hole is 1,600 light years from here. Right. And no one's going to no make it. Yeah. But it's, not, it's a no-go solution. It's not what you do. If you think you've got a gun to your head and you better make it happen. The thing about it is that um, the, the, the answers to time travel are not found in the theories of general relativity. Neither one of them, because they don't add up. This the closest black hole, 1600 light years away. No one's paying for that mission. 
<laughs> and no one's paying for fuel. It's going to take you to try to reach toward the speed of light of a rocket. On top of that, that's it, it, there's no I, solid opinion on what happens if you were to go faster than the speed of light. Some physicists say that that is a misinterpretation of you know what the, those equations actually say in terms of uh, doing that and. Yeah, because the idea is that if you go faster speed of light, then you go back in time. I actually and, have I have yeah. one thought on that. I, I don't disagree with you, but there is a theory that you can fold time and space using gravity or electromagnetic pulse. Is Have you heard of that? I actually have the technology. We already do it. Okay. But we're not folding. It's not, the description isn't that we're folding. The description is that we're contracting. Uh, we, we've got this online with a car, all right? I tried cars to find that. Yeah, I, I couldn't find that video. I was looking, yeah, yeah I was looking for that. The video is on the website for a company. It's uh, tech of infinity, um, dot wordpress mm -hmm. dot com, And it's on the, I think it's not the about page, but it's uh, the other one. It's, it's, it's not in, in the menu section. It's like in the one of the front pages but it's yeah. on there and that's the the video and, where you make the car go faster than it right. could we, normally we have a radar sign yeah we showed the speedometer and we also showed the radar sign mm -hmm. and the radar sign uh we have also we have a uh, professional vhs um jog wheel counter what that means is that you can you can move the uh, the videotape slowly back and forth with the controller and make it quick frame by frame. Mm -hmm. So you have complete control, frame by frame, so it's that. So what we do is we set it up so that at uh, the beginning of the test, the counter is zeroed out and we run the test and then we basically run it for like 13 seconds. Or not 13 seconds, but 13, uh, I don't know, I think it's a second. Okay. Well, we go, anyway, at any rate, we go back and we, we set it up. So we show how long it took it to go that distance from zero to 13. Mm -hmm. And what happens then is that, and that's under normal circumstances. And you can see on the screen where it was. Now, in the complete video, which is not on there, we do another test from that same origination point, And we do it with, with the car going faster, but not with the field because of the field gone. Mm -hmm. And so just to show, but the radar sign will catch it if the car tries to go faster under its own power. Okay. And it will say, hey, you're going, you know, you're going, so 25, you're going 26. So the thing is, I, for just for, to abbreviate everything, I, I left that out. Mm -hmm. And what I do, what the next segment AC is, we're, I don't know, we're further down the street now. But we zero the counter again. I put a piece of black tape on the screen to show where physically on that screen where that that end point is. I mean back it up to zero and then zero it out. So back it up for now, so it's thirteen seconds, zero it out. And then we run it again. And this time at the end of thirteen seconds, the car has gone past the black tape mark that's on the screen. Mm -hmm. And now and the thing is, as you can see in the background there's a school that's also now closer. And it's like, you know, we certainly didn't move this three-story bricks building you know, to try to you know, fool anybody. So, I mean, it's, it's obvious that in 13 seconds of last time, the car went farther mm -hmm. than it did with the, uh, with the fuel on than it did with the fuel off. So, and it's like, there's no, there's no way that could happen unless the fuel was actually contracting space as the car was going down the street. So and, uh, was this yeah. is this a device that you attach to the car, or is it yeah. a modification to the no. engine somehow? No, 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 no. It's no modification to the engine. It was something we attached to the car. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yeah, because otherwise, it, it, modifications to the engine would show up on a speedometer. Okay, but, true. But yeah. the, the increase in speed doesn't show up on a speedometer. It, keeps, it still says it's 125 miles an hour. But in, in, but in reality... With that, with that test with the fuel on, we're actually going like 27.1. Mm -hmm. And you can tell visually that we have traveled longer distance 
down and we, we had before. Mm-hmm. So it's like how that happened. And, and, and on top of that, the radar science says we're not going any faster. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like, so is, yeah, it, so is it a gravity field or is it an electromagnetic field that is it's generated? Electro, it's an electromagnetic field that produces a gravity effect. Ah, okay. Or what they call a gravitic effect. Okay. Yeah, it's based on Einstein's theory of teleparallelism. So if you attach that to a, a rocket ship, you know, or a spacecraft that can go close right. to the speed of light, could it potentially get to the speed of light? It, if that's even... Well, you don't have to do that. You're going to stick it on Elon Musk's rocket. Uh-huh. He's already got the base stainless steel. He launches it. We turn the field on. We pulse it. He kills the rocket engines. And it goes by the speed that he already started out at, which we're now accelerating. Wow. And theoretically, we would go, we would reach the speed of light and go faster than that. Wow. But I don't, I don't believe in extreme velocities like that actually being possible, only because I think that there's stuff in space that will stop it from happening. Oh, okay. You know, the debris, there's the issue of debris, there's the issue of, like, energies building up, but and the metric of the fabric of space time starting to pile up in front of you a little bit. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. We just don't know what will happen. Mm-hmm. But the nice thing about it is, I have a technology where we can find out, but mm-hmm. we just don't know. So mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't make the comment that, oh yeah, we can definitely do this. Theoretically, that's what the math says. Mm-hmm. Well, other than that, who knows? Because we have to do it to find out what really takes place. So the, um, the alternative to that, your, your, solution to that to going back in time is what can you explain a little bit how that is supposed to work well okay which i'm explaining which one the, the so solution the, to go back in time or yeah what? your your solution to go back to to take a, a person or people back mm-hmm. into twelve thousand years that's pretty simple joshua weaver who was the smartest man walking around after einstein died he came with this idea of the delay choice experiment. And the delay choice experiment was essentially a way in which you have a particle that's fired you know, on a certain setup, and under normal circumstances, it would hit a detector. But if you raise this barrier, it will, say, bounce off the barrier. It could be done a number of different ways and it would hit a different detector. But if you do this fine trick, which this is not ideal, which I've been able to approximate, and you, when that photon goes along and right after it passes the area where the barrier is, you flip it up, then the photon doesn't reach the detector. It goes over to the other one. But if the bar- it hit bounced off of the barrier, okay? So, what we were said was that if you could, and, and by the way, that whole process I just, I just described, what is known as retrocausality, and the argument is that they were able to change the past of the particle so that the particle arrived somewhere else than what they knew it was going to or initially arrive at. Mm-hmm. So, that's what the ritual causality thing is. Wheeler says, if you have, say, a star, it's on the other side of a galaxy, you could set up some telescopes or some kind of devices that would detect photons from that star. And by a certain arrangement, you could change the path that photons from that star took to get to Earth you know, vis-a-vis the, this gravitational body that would be in between them, like a, a galaxy or something like that. So you could, you could determine, even though the photon left a billion years ago, you could determine which side of the galaxy it traveled to get to here by how you made a measurement here on Earth some, you know, years and years and millennia later. So the idea was that we have change the path of that those particles so that you know, way back in time we've changed it mm-hmm. so what happens is there's a problem the problem is is that if you do that 
if that's your interpretation, what you're doing, you're violating the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And what that says essentially, in terms of the issue that I'm bringing up, is that you only get one outcome for a measurement. Okay, and then, I mean, quantum mechanics and event can be, can be a measurement, okay? It's not necessarily something you get out of war or not. some kind of measuring instrument that, you know, that actually measure. Um, so we know that the particle, the, the photon, came one way or came the other way. And so the idea that we're changing after the fact is a situation where it's like we're changing the past, but you know, that if you change the past, then you're creating a paradox. So I was studying that, and what I was able to find out was that it's essentially just a, uh, an issue of interpretation. And if you look at it from the point of view, like, okay, if you change, if you do something with one of these particles so that you change something after the fact, what you're really getting as a result is a new presence that has a different past than the original one did if you hadn't done your little, you know, measurement thing. Mm -hmm. So that keeping that in mind, you apply that thinking to the uh, example of in the, the galactic delayed choice uh, experiment. What you're doing is you're actually creating a new presence which now has a different past with, with them, you know, in terms of which way that particle came. So with that in mind, the only thing you have to do is figure out how to do something now that will create a kind of like a switcheroo, if you would, mm -hmm. so that you're now is a copy of the past. All right. Right. Okay. You do that. That's time travel. So are you saying that we're not actually moving through space, but you're just changing time? So. You all right, and I'll just give you the easy interpretation. All right. Okay, you play video games, right? Okay. You do that? Sure. All right, fine. Yeah. Pac-Man is a video game where you're being chased. You're a little Pac-Man. Yeah. You're being chased by these other things that are trying to gobble, up, gobble, gobble him up. And there's certain points where you can make your Pac-Man turn on them and gobble them up. Okay. Okay? Right. Now, here's the deal. Within the construct of that game, those little characters that are trying to gobble him up, they don't even know he's there. They don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Because all they are are the emanations of this software program. All right? And the only thing that, 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 that as far as this interplay, this, in terms of this, this conflict that's going on, it's you versus the game. All right? Yes. And you might think in terms of like, oh, it's my guy versus these little creatures that are trying to gobble up my tag, man. You might be thinking that way, but that is just you versus the game. Those little creatures are just part of the game. And so as a result, that's exactly the way things work in terms of particle physics and everything. They're, the photons, they don't know what's going on mm -hmm. when you change a barrier or whatever. They, they have no consciousness. They don't, they don't have a brain. They don't know who you are. They don't care because they don't care about anything because they can't care about anything because they're just energy or whatever, mm -hmm. all right? However, what does care is the participatory universe model that we were talked about. And just like when you're playing a game, or, you know, you're playing the software, all right, it's the universe of software. It's you interacting with the participatory universe that makes all this crazy uh, quantum mechanics stuff work, all right? You know, people wonder, why Why do we get these strange things? You know, you got spooky action at a distance. You've got, you know, quantum tunneling. you got all these other phenomena that you don't see on a macroscopic level. And for some reason, the answer is that that's just part of what the spiritual universe has happening on that level. Mm -hmm. And when we, we do what we were called interrogating the participatory universe, asking it questions is another way you put it. Then we get certain kinds of answers. And for some reason, if you play around with these quantum particles, you'll get these strange answers back, okay? And that's all those things are. They don't know what's going on. I mean, there's a, there's a great uh, video 
clip of uh, Elaine Aspect, that's his name. And he was a physicist who was able to prove, you know, entanglement and uh, that kind of bell theorem kind of thing. And he was talking about the, de- the delay choice experiment. And he was talking about how they would set up the thing and then the whole photon, you know, comes out and goes, okay, so what are we going to do today? Mm-hmm. He's in the lane, he's got this heavy French accent, which makes it even funnier. And, <laughs> and he says, oh, we're not going to tell you. You just go through first, and then we'll let you know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and I think it's just so funny because it's a cartoonish. But in reality, there is no conversation like that going on. There is no thinking on the photon, mm-hmm. it just does what happens. Yeah. It just like the, the thing just does what happens on the Pac-Man game. So that's all it is. It's not that we're in a video game. It's mm-hmm. that we're in a participatory universe that's running everything, okay? And it's not the portables doing it. And people need to get over that idea. So as a result, and by the way, we could, one of the experiments we conducted shows that the participatory universe is real because when we do these retro causal experiments that we actually call retro world reality, because they're showing that how parallel universes probably do the equation. Um, when we do this, we don't get like a laser pulse that appears out of nowhere and it hits the detector when no laser have been fired, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Which we call an anomalous event. What we get Instead, is we just get a laser hit when no laser has been fired. There is no laser traveling through there. There's no process. It's just bam, you're there. Just like when you do time travel, there is no process. There is no, oh, we're going back in time, mm-hmm. passing your seatbelt. You know, there's, there's none of that. It's like you just do it. You know, you initiate whatever apparatus you're going to have that's going to induce that, that time travel thing, mm-hmm. and you're there. That's it. It's, it's like instantaneous. And that's why it's so dangerous, you know, if you're not ready, because you can do it, and bam, you're there, and maybe you're not in the right spot, maybe you left something behind, maybe you didn't expect it to really happen at that moment, and it brings, you're there, man, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's like, you know, there you go. And so we repeatedly have those kind of results where we get, if the laser pulse of the time traveler, for let's say, then he just appears, you know, in that new spot, you know, there is no, you know, all of a sudden, for example, we were even going to try to, try to do a test where we would use smoke or, you know, fog from dry ice in the area to see if we could see a laser pole appear out of nowhere and then hit the detector. Because we could analyze the video. All these things are videos, mm-hmm. so we can analyze them frame by frame. But instead, I decided, because that was kind of a hassle, so I decided, okay, I'll set up a mirror. Set up a mirror on the wall, and I'll set up our laser uh, activity area so that it's directly in line of sight of that mirror. So anything that happens back there with the lasers being fired and all that, that will show up on the mirror. And then, if we get a laser that hits the beam splitter, that beam splitter will send the pulse directly below the mirror hit the wall. So that way we would know if there was any laser activity going on, even though Kim wasn't aiming at that, because it was aiming at the mirror and it was aiming at the uh, below the wall of the mirror. It was a mirror, it was, it was on the wall where the detection area was, but it was just above it. So we could see if there was any laser activity, we could see it in the mirror, and then we'd see the result from the beam splitter hitting the area below the mirror on the wall. Okay. Now, when we got anomalous hits, guess what? There was no laser activity in that mirror. Mm. We got hits on the wall below it. Yeah, that's why. So I was like, so, so I was like, wait a minute, where did that come from? Because there was no laser activity, but yet we didn't even see the laser coming. You know, mm-hmm. we saw no evidence of it. It's just there on the wall. So that is the participatory universe responding and just giving us the end result. Oh, you want to have something show up out of nowhere? <laughs> there it is. Bam, there it is. Right, right on the wall. There it yeah. is. And so what that means, that means a lot because of what suggests is that if you try to do a time travel event using a quantum mechanical apparatus, then you will end up immediately, instantaneously, 
where it is that you want to go. Okay. There is no process. Okay. And that's important because you cheer a horn off. You won the U.S. Medal of Science Award uh, a number of years ago when Obama was still president. He, in 1992, came up with the idea of using quantum measurements to essentially trigger or drive a apparatus that would dilate time. So I, when I was looking at that, particularly after I started doing my own experiments, I realized, okay, so what I can do is I can change what the machine part of it is and not use the same idea he did, which was based on a gigantic balloon that could rapidly and expand and contract and create the time dilation because of uh, some solutions that he applied from general relativity, which are a pain in the butt to do and it's not the best way to do anything. Um, but instead, it was I, I decided the whole entire thing should have something to do with quantum mechanics, and that way it's just straight. So that meant that we could have a, essentially a quantum triggering apparatus that would drive this machine and, and, and induce the time travel event to be one half half. Mm -hmm. Now we got to figure out how to make the. Uh, the switcher route, basically, I was talking about, which I've already figured out pretty darn well, close how to do it, which we can't talk about though, because it's, all that stuff's weaponizable. Hmm. It'd be a violation of uh, U.S. Code 35, Chapter 17, Segment 181. Okay, we don't want to. We don't want to violate any federal codes or anything like that. So <laughs> let's not do that. But but uh, I, if I can ask you just right. a couple questions about that. Um, sure, go ahead. Once, once you scale that up to where humans can be transported back to uh, 12,000 before, 12 to 12 KB, yeah. are they able to come back to this time, uh, timeline? Well, it, it depends on how you set it up. That's all an engineering problem. That's oh, all it is. Okay. It depends on how you set it up. And that gets into complex technological approaches to like how you want to do this. Do you want to you want to use a, uh, a stable wormhole. Okay. And then you have to figure out how to stabilize it, which I have a pretty good idea how to do that. But will it work? Can we influence where that wormhole is going to open up? Um, can we standardize a means whereby just quantum mechanically that every time we turn the machine on, we're going to get that exact same version of the path that we want. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, that's why it costs more money. I mean, uh, and I don't think it would cost, I don't know, I think it would probably solve the, the rest of the time travel thing for like another 10 grand. Mm -hmm. But in terms of doing it on a large scale, that's why you need more money. That's why you need like around 100000 Okay. And then once you figure that out, once you get that to work it, then it's like to then try to go through that, the process of, setting things back, stabilizing whatever it is that you're doing, or standardizing your approach. That's when it gets to be more expensive, but then what the heck? I mean, you could, <laughs> once you get it stabilized, you can send somebody back and start, you know, getting gold from anywhere in the world you want, because mm -hmm. no one's going to be there to stop you. And it's not going to affect the, where, for example, China has land that has lots of very important minerals on it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, thing about it is we can go back and just take that stuff. But the thing is, is that it's not going to affect China here. They right. never know it. In other words, it's not like all of a sudden they get a survey. Mm -hmm. And wait a minute, we had more metals here. We know because of the last time we did this survey. Where's, where's our, and I forget what they call yeah. those minerals that they're using in a lot of electronics and all that kind of stuff. Rare earth minerals of China, China. Not, not the same one. Yeah. So it's a, it's a completely different timeline, and you're not affecting anything in, in this timeline at all. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I love that um, theory or that analysis that you made with um, the Avengers movie, <laughs> the, way they, right, the, right. Way, the way they explained it, because that was such a perfect way of explaining it, just a multi, it's basically a multi-universe theory, right? Yeah, it was, it was based pretty close to the whole you know, quantum mechanics of approach mm -hmm. and they they bent a little things here and there but other than that 
I mean, I just, I actually stood up in a theater and cheered <laughs> when, yeah. when the Hulk, they call him Professor Hulk, I think. Yeah. When that, that, that blending of Bruce Banner and the Hulk that they had. And when he, I mean, they were talking about why they couldn't do all this stuff because, of, you know, everyone knows because of the hot tub time machine and all this other kind of, all these other BS movies, you know, that have time travel on them. And, and, and the Professor Hulk goes, I don't know why people believe that because it's wrong. And I <laughs> stood up and said, yes! Yeah. I just literally stood up in the speaker. Yeah. But I actually stood up and did that because yeah. I'm so sick and tired of all this BS that these sci-fi writers are too lazy to even sit back and crack open a book and figure out how time travel might really work yeah. instead of just cranking all this crap. And it just makes me want to projectile vomit yeah. after a while. And it's have Professor Holt actually say, I don't know why you believe it, because it's wrong. <laughs> I was just like, hell yeah. That was great. I'll never forget that. <laughs> it was so funny. So uh, with your with your, uh, with your your experimentation, uh, you know, and again, I don't want you to give anything away that you can't, but have you right. have you tried it with anything bigger than particles? Like, uh, have, have you tried it with anything tangible? Okay, that's where we are now. And it, the, the key thing was that we're doing, it, so as far as particles or whatever, what we're really doing is we were just observing and seeing how these different experiments would work in terms of creating those anomalous effects. But what we really want to do is you use that the way you cure Harnoff, you know, suggested, and you use that as part of a time machine. And because of what would happen with that, um, that device, how we would set it up, then when, for example, when we would normally get our anomalous hit, all right? You know, I hit without a cause. Yeah. When that happened, pow, that would trigger uh, uh, us being in another universe, and you know, in, a, in another time or whatever, how we set it up. So that's the thing. So basically, even though we were looking at the behavior, what was going on with these particles, that in and of itself were going to turn into a mechanism because that was what the cure on of original idea was about. Mm -hmm. You can make a measurement on something, you know, it's in a quantum state, and then based on what the results you got from that, you could then cause the contraction or expansion of this balloon that would create time dilation. So this is the point that you guys are at now? I'm sorry? Is this the point that you guys are at now? Yeah, where we are is on the goal line, whereby... All we have to do is to determine which of the different options that we've identified could work as, you know, a time travel mechanism. And and if it does, that's it, done. Mm-hmm. Really know what to do to try to make it happen. We just have to make it happen. It's like it's like basically having a safe with a lock, okay? Yeah. And all you need is somebody who knows how to basically you know, crack the safe. Okay. And that's essentially where we are. And as soon as just the minute we do that and crack the safe, bam, the doors pops open. Game over. And if so, so the the biggest barrier that you're uh, faced with right now is it a time issue? Like, uh, do you need more time to figure out the problem, or is it a money yeah, issue? Well, it's at this point, just in terms of trying to do time travel at all. So not not even talking about trying to send a whole bunch of people. Mm-hmm. Just trying to do time travel at all. It boils down to a time thing. But, you know, time is money. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah, sure. And right now, see, at this, uh, this all con event where I'm at in uh, Addison, Texas, I've announced what I call Operation uh, COVID-19. Okay. When, and and, and it's, and it's the 12 monkeys and midnight scenario. Yeah. And what that I'm saying is what that means is that we're now going to increase and, uh, and uh, escalate our efforts to try to get this to happen because we don't know what's going on with this COVID-19 thing. You know, the 
coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So it's like the movie 12 Monkeys. Mm -hmm. In that movie, a virus happens that kills a whole bunch of people and drives them underground, and they don't know what caused it, so they send these, uh, you know, forced (laughs) volunteers back in time, you know, and, 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 and the funny thing about it is the people sending them back in time don't quite know what they're doing. But it ended up happening was that they were sending people through a long time by mistake. Yeah. Like Bruce Willis ends up in World War One yeah. along with another guy, okay? So the thing is is that um, with what they're doing now was legit in that they send them back in time to try to find what the cause of the virus was so they can return to the future they came from. Hmm give them the solution and then fix it in the future. Yeah. The, the part of the movie that was screwed up was Bruce Willis, yeah. Um, the fact that he had this dream where he'd seen this scenario happen before at the airport. Mm-hmm. And so it gives you the impression that, you know, it's already happened before and it's like it's some kind of a loop or something. Yeah. Which, from a time travel physics point of view, doesn't really add up. Even though people might try to make it, it doesn't. So that's another thing about the film I didn't like. But other than that, I thought it was great. Other than that, we're almost in an inverted in an equation of that whole scenario right now. Yeah. Instead of like trying to find the cause of the virus, so and that so we can stop it. And in order to do that, we use time travel. We're trying to do. We know what causes this virus. So we're trying to use time travel. And get the heck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget it. Yeah, you know? that's not the only problem that we're faced with. We've got, like I said earlier, we've got climate change, the threat of that's meteor true. strikes, nuclear war, uh, you know, is always on the table for existential threats. So if we could get out of here and dial back the time to 12,000, and it's is it 12,000 B.C. or 12,000 years ago? Years ago. Okay, so 10,000 BC, about about the end of the last ice age, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. He's, that's very well, very interesting. There stuff. were people around back then, and oh, there. Oh, yeah. Back, uh, go Becky Tepley was built sometime around that time period. Yeah, there's a couple of other um, civilizations too, and then. Dr. Shock, he believes that the pyramids were built around that time as well. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, there's a there's a lot of uh a lot of stuff that was uh built by humans around that time ago. Now, okay, so if if when we're able to dial back that time and we start setting up settlements back in that 12KB um right. now is that it, it, are we going to experience humans on earth at that time as well depends on where you show up and see this is where the geologists and the historians and archaeologists come in and they can decide wherever they want to show up you okay. know what I'm saying? yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and it's not even something I want to do I know I really have no interest in going into that time period I want to get 1971 um, <laughs> that, that was my full intention I got other people that are actually funding me that want to go to other time periods, but wow. my this, this whole thing about going back twelve thousand years was my solution for everybody else that was like bugging me, you know, causing this Noah uh, syndrome, you know, like oh take me to take me to right. like, give me a break, you know. So um, basically, what I did was I formulated a plan whereby I, it's, it would be possible for governments or philanthropists or whatever that wanted to, to do something like this because it's cheap anyway I mean what the heck Elon Musk could pay for it yeah, yeah. that was lunch money but I mean you know, if it works how yeah. I mean I mean, it, well, that's an ego thing I mean it's like if it works it, some guy some billionaire could go wow I can take credit for saving humanity. <laughs> True. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, fine. Go ahead, take the credit. I don't care. You know. But the thing about it is that it's it's doable. It's, it's it's so doable. It's frightening because I've seen some of the side effect things that happen from this research that are weird. And I think it. I think that the 
the source of some of these weird things that manifest themselves is the participatory universe. But um, what happens, and that you'll hear this from other sources doing other kinds of things that might be similar one way or the other. What happens is that as you start messing around with some of these esoteric things, you'll start to see things that were synchronistic in nature. Yes. Things that are like things that you already know about. Right. right. They'll start popping up that, you know, will basically just blow you away. I mean, we've I've seen stuff like that today. I just see that where I'm at right now. Um, it's it's unreal. And it, it's a fact. I've heard this, there's account after account after account of people, for example, that start doing certain, doing certain kinds of research that will start to see these synchronicities start to pop up. And I even had Fred Allen Wolf, who appears in the motion picture, what the bleep do we know, who was a physicist. He was one of the quote-unquote hippies that saved physics. Um, he was my mentor as far as of, uh, in terms of uh, what we call mechanics is concerned, or some of the more interesting aspects of it. And we we met because I was doing things in a certain area, not for a scientific reason, but just more from an artistic point of view. But we started having these synchronicities pop up. Mm -hmm. And I met him, and he, he saw the evidence for what was going on. Because there was, there was no arguing about it. I mean, I had multiple witnesses, we had physical evidence, you know, whatever. So he goes, he says, okay, this is basically what could be happening. He says, you're a receiver. You're tuning into something that's real. And as you tune into it, and people start to hang out with you and resonate with you, and things are like those kind of things are going to start manifesting around you. Okay, that was the quote. I've, I've seen it say it so many times, I've got to memorize. That's the quote. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the situation. <clears throat> if that's true, we know it's true because it's still going to happen. But that being the case, that means if you tweak whatever it is that you're doing, whatever it is that you're tuning into, and things that are like those things start to manifest around you, at a certain point, there isn't going to be things like that stuff that start to manifest. It's going to be that stuff. You're going to you get the real thing. All right? Mm -hmm. And that's the situation. We're already at the point where we're getting the things that are like those kind of things. Yeah. You know, we're, already, we're already there. And then we've seen that under other, under, under other circumstances before. So it's like, we're not surprised. Now, Rudy Rucker is a famous mathematician. He said that synchronicity is part of a first class universe, and that's what we live in. However, if you get a number of synchronicities that are happening, they're all interrelated, like this scenario I just gave you. But if you get like a number of them that's like more than five, like completely close to 10 or more, then it violates the laws of probability. And they take on what, what we would call a meaningful arrangement. And that's what something's going on. Hmm. Now, when you do these kind of experimental work things that we're talking about, that's when you can start to see those kind of things take place. Mm -hmm. So then it's just a matter of like, okay, so let's raise the probability that we're going to get exactly the kind of thing we want to have happen and not just a copy of it, not just a simulation of it, not just like, you know, a clone of it. We want the real thing, you know? But you're, you're halfway there. You're more than halfway there. If you get those and incidents taking place, but you get a whole bunch of them. I think we should probably close it out tonight because I've been, okay. I mean, I could sit here and talk to you for a couple more hours, but I don't sure. really think I, I should. Um, okay. But uh, is there any way that I can reach out to you like a couple months from now and check up on you and see how what the status of your, of your get progress is? What's that? Oh, get a hold of David? Get a hold of David. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right. For sure. I'll do that. And I follow you on Twitter, so I'll keep uh i'll keep up to date with sure. your, whatever you post on twitter um yeah i'll be posting stuff there as usual cool sounds good all right marshall well, appreciate your time and uh hope you have a good time there in uh in, in for the rest of the conference I that the world is an 
end out from under us. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. Exactly. All yeah. right, take care now. All right, then. You too. Take care. All right, bye. Bye. That's it for this episode, ladies and gentlemen. Whether you agree or disagree with Marshall's views, he certainly has some unique ideas about the world we live in and the potential calamities we're faced with, especially in these uncertain times. Marshall and I continued our conversation for a while longer and got into some other things, but the parts I've shared are definitely the most relevant to listeners of this podcast, and I felt it best to keep the episode under one hour. If you're interested in hearing the whole conversation, please let me know. My sincere thanks to Marshall for allowing me to spend this time with him and sharing his insight and knowledge with me and all of you. Anyone interested in learning more about Marshall's work, I encourage you to read his papers at academia.edu and follow him on Twitter. Links to Marshall's work will be in the description for this podcast. If you or someone you know has a comment or question about the conversation, please contact me. You can email me at deadhandradio at gmail.com or you can connect with me on Twitter at deadhandradio. This is Andrew Hall and you've been listening to Dead Hand Radio.